So I uh, moved to Caldwell in 2001, not really knowing what I wanted to do. Yeah, good. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, so, <laughs> as you can see, I definitely didn't know what I wanted to do. That is uh, definitely not a, uh, or definitely is a Sprite bottle, and I am not in the basement of the Kappa Sig house in this <laughs> Uh So I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, or actually I did know what I wanted to do, it just changed every semester. Uh, amazingly, I actually started and finished as a biology major, uh, but I meandered around a lot. I took a lot of history classes, mainly because I like to sit in the back and listen to stories. Uh, and I took a lot of business classes because all my roommates were business majors and they had all the books. Uh, I thought maybe in the future it would help me a little bit, but who knew? Um, so all that bouncing around happened because really I didn't know where to stick. And uh, at the time it was really fun, but I was always a little bit worried. Um, I, I came to college thinking that I needed to be on a straight path. Uh, you know, you take intro classes, they get you to intermediate classes, advanced electives, you get into grad school, some admirable job in my 20s, and I make lots of money, make my family proud, that kind of thing. I just, probably I hadn't found my path yet. So, uh, I, after a little bit of time of the bouncing around, I decided that I needed to focus on at least a subject. Uh, biology had always, had always called to me, and so I kind of, scoured everything that second floor Boone had to offer. Uh, microbiology was a big one. Internships uh, pushed me away from that. Physical therapy, conservation ecology. Uh, I took so many classes with Jensen and counted so many ground squirrel holes that that was definitely not an option. <laughs> Nothing that I tried lasted very long, uh, despite my, my hardest efforts. Um, and then, actually, my senior year, my last year, I decided to uh, go the medical, medical school route. So I took the MCATs, and I made it over the, past the first couple hurdles of the application process. And I, I realized that I was lying on the applications, and I was lying to myself. So the next month, I actually decided to apply to culinary school. I had uh, always been drawn to food, uh, mainly because of my family. It's, it's their favorite subject. We talk about lunch at breakfast, we talk about dinner at lunch, <laughs> and we talk about the next breakfast at dinner. <laughs> but I never thought it could be a viable career, and um, to be honest, I, I, I thought it was a total 180, and I was behind the ball a bit. Um, but my family supported my decision, and I dove in head first, and I quickly, quickly realized uh, that I actually had a very unique advantage in the culinary world. Um, you know, I had knowledge from college, that, that was for sure, but I realized in culinary school that what I got here was that I learned how to learn, and that gave me a huge leg up. Um, my, uh, my liberal arts education, I didn't realize until probably actually coming up with this talk, it, it really, you know, it, it shaped the way that I would cook, and it, and it shaped the chef that I've become. And so uh, I'm very appreciative of it. So initially I was drawn into the culinary world, the restaurant world from the, the adrenaline, the camaraderie of a busy night service. Um, but, but I also took a very studious approach to it. And uh, after those long days, I would just dive into as many cookbooks as I could find. Um, so I could apply a science background uh, and, and find the answers to the what, the how, the why that I wasn't necessarily getting from, from fellow cooks or even the chefs that I worked with. Uh, cooking sort of became this amazing hybrid for me. It was, it was knowledge, um, but there was also a spontaneity that I was really drawn to. You know, I had like, I'd found a balance in my life for the first time between the research portion of my brain and, and the really off the cuff and freewheeling desires of my heart. Um, so I found my path, and from there, my experiences in college actually kept coming back up, and it's become a very sustainable source of creative inspiration for me. So um, I'll give you just a few quick examples of that. Maybe. 
Whoops. So uh, this is a dish about Idaho's favorite fungus, the morel. Uh, so there, you know, there's a, cu a couple different kinds. There's naturals, there's grays, there's blondes, there's all sorts of them. Uh, this dish in particular is about the burn morels. And they're very common in here, Montana, Oregon, a little bit of Washington as well. Um, the burn morels in specific grow faster. They're very opportunistic. They have less, a, a thinner wall so they can pop up. And um, they do burn, or they grow in, in forest fire burned areas. But very uniquely, the foragers that go out say that it's not just any kind of fire, it's actually the medium sized fires. So the ones that the, the ground is scorched and ashy and, and, and everything on the ground is, is burnt up. But the trees typically still, the taller trees still have pine needles in them that have fallen down. So that's what they look for. They look for black soil as well as a little bit of pine uh, pine tips coming down. Um, so that's kind of what this dish is about. So um, this is actually a ramen dish. It's uh, squid ink and ash noodles. The morels themselves make the broth. There's some that are pickled off. Um, and then there's pine tips and pine oil that we harvested in the spring that are kind of sp sorry, sprinkled on top there. Oh, there's also just a little bit of jalapeno in there just to kind of give a nod, <laughs> nod to the fire. This is a pretty, uh, this is actually a cool dish. It, it, it was sort of clicked in our heads that we could look at food a little bit differently. Um, so this, this was mainly from all the history classes, I guess. Uh, this was a dish for a, a wine dinner we did with Split Rail Winery in Garden City. Jed Glavin uh, runs that one. And he loves Rhone varietals of wine. Um, that's Rhone, you know, is southern France, close to Italy. Um, capital is Lyon. Uh, they're known for their Grenache, Mouved, Syrah, blends. Chateau Neuf de Pop is probably the most famous wine that comes from that region. Um, so so uh, we kind of looked at that and we dove into the area of Rhone and we looked at Lyon and there's a very well-known salad called a Lyonnaise salad. Uh, well, Jed also has a unique fermenter at his place. It's a, it's a large cement egg and the egg shape actually gives a little bit of convection just from the shape itself. The cement gives flavor into the wine. So, as you would do, we decided to com combine those two ideas. A Lyonnaise salad is frisé, mustard, a little bit of bacon, and then hard-boiled eggs. The eggs were the connection to the, to the fermenter. And from there, we kind of played around with, well, how do we get cement into your food? Um, so we researched sort of the history of cement and went back to Roman times. And you know, um, found that it's a lot of lime, clay, water. That's, that's kind of like the three main ones that we had to work with. So the egg on here is a quail egg. Those are potatoes that have been hard boiled and then dipped in bentonite clay, which is edible. There's a lot of lime, in this case, actual lime zest that creates a vinaigrette. Of the salad that's underneath a little bit of dried meringue, that's mainly there for texture and brittleness, just to kind of play on that cement a little bit more. All right, and then uh, anatomy, of course. So my senior year, I took a cadaver class, which was probably my favorite course that I took. Um, one, because it was just really, it was, it was just really interesting to me, but two, actually that was the first day of class, my senior year of that winter semester, that's where I met my wife for the first time. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's, I guess that's why it sticks in my head. You know, there's, there's a lot of connections between that anatomy class and butchery. Um, muscles run the same, right? <laughs> Long justimus dorsi is ribeye. Your, your glutes are basically top round. So, <laughs> so it helps. It definitely helps. But what was really cool is we actually, um, we run a lot of whole, anim whole animal butchery. So we, we get half pigs, half lambs, whole lambs, things like that, and we can custom butcher things. It helps us creatively. Uh, we get dishes based on those cuts, but it also helps us on food cost. It's also just a really good way to teach young cooks how to look at their food and their product a little bit differently. Um, so the other cool thing about this dish, this is a lamb dish, um, and it's connected to Janie Burns, who is an alumnus from the college, and she is actually a distinguished alumni as well. She graduated in 77, and she owns a farm in Nampa called Meadowlark Farm. This was a dish from a menu that we ran 
Uh, the menu was themed, as most of them became at the end, um, and it was in March, and it was for Women's History Month, where we took each, every dish was based on a historical or important woman in the culinary world, um, Alice Waters, Eugenie Brassier, my grandmother, uh, and Janie, of course. So um, at the time of the farm, there, in March, there wasn't too much out there, uh, but Janie was, has always been such an inspiration for us. So this is her lamb. This is a lamb chop that we butchered ourselves. And then some of the other portions have been braised off. We uh, went out to the farm and noticed that things were just starting to sprout up. So we had, uh, she also had a bunch of cellared things. So we have sunchokes here, a lot of onion, a lot of beet, and then um, beans and seeds that we actually sprouted in the restaurant just to kind of mimic the ground that was out there at the time. So we, um, those are just three quick dishes. We had over eight, 150 in five years. So we were really pumping them out, but we were leaning a lot on, on this creative side um, of the sustainable creativity. And a lot, again, a lot of that came from the college. But being a chef, especially nowadays, is not just about creativity. Um, we, we have to run a business. We have to lead a team. We need to know statistics, psychology, accounting, foreign language. There's a little theater in there as well, I guess. Um, especially now, we need, to know, we need to know how to market and how to brand ourselves. We need to know about environmental politics uh, and public health. Um, so it's, it's a growing, burgeoning business for us. We need to know how to teach. This is us at a tasting where everyone sits down and we talk about the dishes. Um, most importantly, though, we still need to understand how to learn continuously. That's kind of the team aspect here. So there was definitely a time in my college education experience that I thought my years were a little bit wasted on me with the career change and diving into something else. I thought I'd squandered those years. But now I, I really understand that I've, I've just been on a different path, one that meanders and goes off trail and stops to forge things every once in a while. I wouldn't be the chef I am and the person that I am without uh, my college experience, the liberal arts education, and for that I am extremely grateful. So, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, excuse me. Uh, so the restaurant's name is Kin. Uh, when State and Lemp uh, cl didn't close, it just became new ownership. Uh, our whole staff decided to stop at the same time together. We had actually had the same core kitchen for four years, which in an industry that has huge turnover, that meant a lot to us. We f genuinely felt like a family. Um, and we had a lot of community support as well. So the name Kin just made sense to us. Um, the idea is to take the tasting menu thing that we did at St. Limp and just put it into a slightly more uh, modern building, I guess. It was, a little, it was falling apart on us a bit. Um, but we also want to hit a larger demographic. We want to be able to cook for more people. So that's why we have a bar attached to it. That'll be seven days a week. It'll be a la carte. You can pop in here and there. You don't necessarily have to uh, you know, sign on to a two and a half, three hour meal. Um, a big thing of the decision to move was just to grow a little bit incrementally. We knew that we had that retention and we were happy for it, but we needed to pay our staff better. So we needed other resources of revenue. Um, cooking is hard to make a livable wage. You work long hours, you kind of fall into a lifestyle that's not necessarily sustainable. And so we want to kind of help change that in the industry a bit. Um, and that starts with getting, being able to pay a little bit better. Yeah. We'll see if it works. Um. Well, I mean, it, 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 this might sound a little cliche, but it changes with the seasons. I, I tend to get bored with an ingredient pretty quickly until it comes back around the next year. Morels are actually pretty good because uh, not living and cooking in Idaho so much, I didn't understand just like 
the frenzy that people get into, and also being able to go out and forage things. Um, a couple other specific ingredients, uh, elder flowers, elder, elder blossoms, you know, um, things that we forage a lot, actually. Um, there's a lot of restaurants in Europe and all over the country now that, that are kind of delving into their own native surroundings. And we're starting to do that as well. So we go into the foothills, we go up into, you know, up north a little bit more and we're getting a good base of edible uh, native plants. Um, so we kind of geek out on sticky laurel. You know, it's related to bay, but it, when you steep it and it makes a tea that tastes like grape juice and, and you can find it all over. And you know, we go up to Bogus and we find these things. Uh, pine tips, like on that morel dish as well. They're really fun. They only come out in April, May, and it's those little shoots that are coming out. Blue spruce is, tends to be the best, really citrusy, obviously piney, but um, cool things like that. You know, honestly, like, we, they're free to us. <laughs> so we like that, and it gets us out. You know, we get out into nature, we get to hike, we get to, you know, you, you get to talk about the dishes as you're sort of out there with the team, so. Yeah, well, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's, it kind of felt like it, I was making the wrong decision. I, I, uh, <laughs> I would have to say that I, I, was always, I was always supported very strongly from my family and my friends and, and those close. They, they helped through certain financial hard times. Um, again, cooking, it, it's hard. Um, but, yeah, if at the end of the day we know that if we're going to if we're going to be in a small kitchen for 12 hours, uh, we better be doing what we like. And fortunately, most of the places I've worked have also been open kitchens. So you, while you're cooking, while you're there, you actually get to watch people enjoy. There's nothing better than seeing someone close their eyes and eat your food. Um, so it's a little thing, but, but I've learned that, you know, we're, it doesn't seem so important. But then I remember a lot of meals specifically around celebratory moments and things like that. Um, so, so we know that it's important, you know, so yeah, we're really happy.